outside of associates because I want you guys to have um, some advantages. So hopefully you guys will find this helpful. Um, I'm gonna start just, we talk a lot lately about the value that we bring to our clients as agents and how we can show our value. And honestly, I'm glad that this conversation is taking place right now. It should have been something that we've considered for years. Um, but now with the settlement and, and changes happening, it's more important than ever to show our value. And as a listing agent, the burden of the appraisal falls on you, not the buyer's agent. So everything that we're going to talk today about a CMA is really helpful for listing agents. Certainly it applies to buyer agents as well. But for listing agents, it is important to remember. Yes, Stan. You remember two, three years ago when the buyer's agents were trying to justify appraisals and the seller's agents were like, eh, I'll just go to the next guy. Yeah. Uh, we may get there in the next year or so, but you're absolutely right. Like, like the list agent should be the one that's taking the burden on for justifying the values. Uh, that may shift, but uh, I just had that thought when you mentioned that. Yes, and 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 we'll talk about how the market changes. Um, but really, at any market, the listing agent should know how to deal with the appraisal. There are three most stressful parts of listing a home that studies have found. The first is receiving an offer. So like Dan said, two years ago, receiving an offer was not scary for sellers because you could put a cardboard box out on your front lawn that said for sale, and you're going to get 10 offers within the hour. So that was not scary in that market for sellers. Inspection, some of them didn't care. We're not making repairs. We have so many offers. But the appraisal is always something that even in the easiest market still gives somebody, whether it's a seller or the buyer, a little anxiety. So as agents, if you have a strong understanding of appraisals and what appraisers are looking for, that's something that your typical homeowner does not have. So when you're talking to somebody and they're like, well, maybe we'll sell for sell by owner. We don't really need an agent. Start talking to them about appraisal issues and watch their eyes glaze over. Now you've got them. Okay. So how do appraisers look for comps? This was something that we kept getting um, questioned when the MLS took I'm switching some things on my screen. When the MLS took the CMA values off of the MLS that we could just plug in and agents suddenly became very nervous and they kept saying, well, what numbers do appraisers use? And I kept trying to tell agents that's not how most appraisers do it. So most appraisers will start their analysis by looking for the most comparable properties. They're not looking, and I know that sounds obvious, but it's something that agents forget. Appraisers are not concerned with the value adjustments that they're going to make. That is typically the very last step or one of the very last steps in the appraisal process. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that appraisers look for are homes that are going to have the least number of adjustments made. So think about this as a listing agent or as a buyer's agent, you're doing a CMA in a condo subdivision and the condos are all selling within $5,000 of each other. They're all pretty much model matches. Some of them might be slightly more updated than the others, but there's no real differences. Is that a CMA that's gonna stress you out as an agent? Most likely no, because there's not a huge range of value, right? It's very tight. And you can very quickly look at the comps in that subdivision, in that project, and tell your seller, hey, this is where homes are selling right now. That's an easy conversation. Most of the time, agents get concerned about CMAs when they have unique properties. So we're going to teach you how to find comparables for unique properties um, to make it easier, just like you would in a cookie cutter you know, subdivision or condo. Gosh, I keep losing my screen. There we go. Okay, so the first step that I would like you guys to remember is to please do this analysis early as part of your listing. So before you go back to your sellers with a price that you are recommending that they list it to, I want you to do a full analysis, especially as listing agents. Um, 
if you you're going to have to do this work at one point or the other, so you may as well do it early on and have all of this information. So completing your full analysis before you list the home as part of your listing process will give you the following benefits. It will help you and your seller determine the right listing price based off of their goals. You can use the analysis to help convince buyers and agents of your list price. I don't know if any of you have been a listing agent where you've received a phone call from a buyer's agent and they say, do you have any comps to support that? Or we just don't see that that value is going to come in. If you have a full analysis, and I'll show you what these analysis look like, if you have a full analysis that you can send over to a buyer's agent, they're going to have a much harder time justifying bringing in a low price. Um, and then having the data readily available to give the appraiser before they complete the report is by far the single most important thing that you can remember. If you wait to talk to the appraiser until after they've completed their appraisal report, the chances of you getting that appraisal value where you need it to be is significantly lower than if you do it before. And I will tell you why in just one minute. So appraisers are tasked with determining who the typical buyer is and what the typical buyer will pay for a property. That's the entire point of an appraisal, is to determine the market value that a typical buyer will find in a property. There's only one problem with this. Appraisers don't work with buyers. Mm -hmm. So we are tasking appraisers to answer a question on a demographic of, of people that they don't work with. Who does? Agents. Agents work with buyers every day. So you have the data and the insight that appraisers are desperate to obtain. But most agents don't know how to give that information to the appraiser or what information to give the appraiser. So first of all, we're going to talk about who is the typical buyer? Who is going to be the buyer that is interested in your listing? What are they looking for? Does the property have specific features that will attract those buyers? Do those features add value for the typical buyer? So let me give you an example. Um, I just listed a home on Friday. It's a bungalow in Ogden. At face value, there's nothing unique about it. But there, are, there are two features that are unique. One, it has a large lot, which is not necessarily unique to the neighborhood. But it has been turned into a homestead. It has multiple shops and outbuildings. It's got garden spaces and irrigation. It's got chicken coops, like all the things for an urban homestead. It also has a second feature that's super unique, which is a detached arcade. It's like a 700 square foot arcade that comes with all of the arcade games included, including skee-ball, right? So it's awesome. In looking at this listing, I had a conversation with the sellers who are going to be the buyers of a property like this. You're going to have maybe two competing buyers. You've got people that want a homestead, an urban homestead. You want people that want to grow all of their own produce. And there's definitely a large demographic of buyers that look for that. You also might have first time home buyers or younger buyers that love the arcade. So we listed it on Friday, showing start today. I already have a full price offer. That offer loved the arcade. I have a showing happening right now. The buyer's agent has already sent me a text. That buyer most likely will be sending an offer. That buyer loves the garden and the homesteading opportunities. So we've got specific features that have attracted buyers. I have already done an analysis. We already knew that those would be the most typical buyers of this property. Now I'm going to be collecting feedback on what features really attracted those buyers so that when the appraisal or the appraiser calls me to do the appraisal, I have data that I'm going to share. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, we also need to look at the features and do they add value for the typical buyer? Uh, swimming pools is a is a great example. You can have a swimming pool in in great uh, condition on a high end home, and you might get more buyers that in that specific micro market of high end homes that are more interested in a swimming pool 
then maybe a rundown swimming pool that's going to need a lot of repairs, you might actually give a negative value for something like that because buyers in that market aren't looking for it. So this is where your analysis, your knowledge of the market as an agent is going to be more powerful than any data that the appraiser has mm -hmm. because you're the one who knows what buyers are looking for in that market. And this is where you can kind of show your value, your experience and your skill level to your clients. Also look for features that appeal to a specific group of buyers. And that will be critical in determining which comps you look for. My favorite example always is horse property. If you work in an area where there is horse property, um, it's zoned for horses, first of all, it has to be zoned, it always has to be legal. And then also, do you have any features? Do you have a barn? Do you have a corral? Do you have anything like that? If so, you very likely are going to have people who are looking for horse property. So you don't need to market it to perhaps first time home buyers or people looking to downsize, right? That would be a different market. That would be a different analysis. You're going to do all of your marketing for horse property. And that can determine how you market the home as well which is why it's another important reason to do this at the beginning of your listing and not wait until you have an, an offer. The next step is to qualify the features of the property. Rather than paying attention to this feature is worth X amount of dollars, make a list. We kind of already do this as listing agents. I have found a lot of listing agents do this already but make a list of the features of the property, which ones are positive and which ones are negative compared to some of the other comps. Is the property bigger or smaller than most of the comps in the neighborhood? What features does it have? Are they positive features, negative features? Make that list and use that list when looking for comparable properties. How does it match up? If you have a property that has six positives and three negatives, Try to find comps that have six positives and three negatives. And if you can't find something that matches exactly, which is very often the case, try to bracket it, which means look for properties that are inferior in some way to yours and superior and see where they meet in the middle. Um, look at the features that will matter most to the typical buyer of that property. Um, just because a home has a feature doesn't mean that that feature is going to appeal to every buyer. So definitely highlight the ones that are going to matter the most. And then determine the utility of that feature, like we talked about with swimming pools. Um, is it truly going to impact the value of the home, and is it a negative or a positive impact? Another example I like to give with uh, this kind of study is bedroom and bathroom count. And this is a conversation that Dan and I just had last week. So I just remodeled my personal home over the last couple of years. And before we remodeled it, we completely gutted the home. It's like a new build. We had nine bedrooms. Y'all, I am not the Brady Bunch. I do not have enough kids to fill up nine bedrooms. And the bedrooms were small. The utility of, small, of nine small bedrooms is not what I needed. What I needed were only a few bedrooms, but I needed them larger. I needed the space to be a little bit bigger. So when we remodeled our home, we used an architect. And I told the architect, I no longer wanted nine bedrooms, wanted or needed. And she looked at me and she's older, she has now retired and she said, oh, well, you know, bedrooms are worth X amount of dollars. And so you're really gonna lessen the value of your home by getting rid of those bedrooms. And that is not the case. One feature, does not necessarily mean that if you times that feature by nine or by 10, that you're going to have the same value. One bedroom is very important to have in a home. Two bedrooms can be very important, maybe even three bedrooms. But the difference between three bedroom or a four bedroom home and a nine bedroom home, at some point, those bedrooms might actually be a negative. Same with bathrooms. If you've got two bathrooms versus, or one bathroom versus two bathrooms, the difference in value between a one bathroom home and a two bathroom home is significant because not everybody wants to share their bathroom. But if you go from two bathrooms to seven bathrooms, I will have buyers that say, I don't wanna clean that, right? They're no longer looking at that feature as a positive because 
the utility of that feature has changed by the number of those features represented. Yeah, Ashley, I just, uh, on the appraisal that we were talking about when we had this conversation, I just pulled it up real quick here. And the wording from the appraiser was bedrooms are adjusted at 100,000 per room for bedroom counts below a total of four. Right. And what was the adjustment for bedroom counts over four? Zero. Yeah. So, because, and this was a high end home. We should, we should, we should this was that. luxury, $4 million listing. But, you know, in that appraiser's opinion, they're almost pointless to have more mm -hmm. than four mm -hmm. bedrooms that you need three or four. Like, that's kind of seems standard. That's what people are expecting. But more than that, you're kind of taking away square footage from other important places. And you, there's a sufficient number of bedrooms. And then in his opinion, for this particular property, that was the number. And anything above that doesn't add value at all. And the appraiser hold, was hold the phone. that specific market. Hold, hold the phone. Dan, did you just say that an additional bedroom was worth $100,000 to a, that appraiser? Uh, so below four was a $100,000 adjustment and then above four was zero. But is that just on high end? Like I'm, I'm, I'm shook right now. A hundred thousand so, for one bedroom. I I think this is this is the extreme example, and I'd be more than happy to show you this report. But like this was for this one particular Park City um, appraisal. Okay. Um, Par yeah. It was a four million dollar. I'll, I'll talk to you about home. it later. I'll do, I'll talk to you about it later. I don't want to monopolize. No, 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 but I think. I think, Jashelle, I think the point, and Ashley said this, I think the point is you look at the specific home and you said, what is the need in that specific home for that for that group of buyers? What's the typical buyer of that home really wanting, right? Okay. For luxury in Park City, it's not a ton of bedrooms. It's a, fit, it's a sufficient amount of bedrooms, right? But once you get to that four or five, there's no additive value to have more bedrooms. And okay, so gotcha. Value, there is a takeaway to have less bedrooms, right? Like you got to have four in this particular market. Um, but above that, there's no additive value was the appraiser's contention. Got it. And, and I agree with that. And, and you also have to look, this is why it was so critical to me that the MLS get rid of these flat adjustments because they were adjusting bedrooms at like $5,000. And it didn't matter if this was a condo in Ogden that's selling for $185,000 or a listing in Park City that's listed for $10 million. And they were making the same adjustment. And that that's ridiculous. You would, you would make the adjustment based on its contribution to the home in that market. So I think Dan's example is a perfect example to highlight you would never make the same adjustment on a hundred thousand dollar condo or a house in vernal versus a ten million dollar listing in park city and what's critical is that you know the market that you're working in yeah going from a one to two or three bedroom condo those are massive adjustments those are big big differences a, a three bedroom condo versus a one bedroom condo but you know once you have a sufficient number of bedrooms in a home right then, you know, like to your point, your nine bedroom example, like what's the difference between a seven bedroom and a nine bedroom? It's, it might be zero. It might actually be negative, you know, negative to have nine. Right. So yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. So the next slide is what matters in the current market? You guys, markets change. And going back to the bedroom, when I was younger, everyone in my neighborhood had at least five kids. That was the average number of kids in the area that I grew up. And if you had a home with less than six, that was six bedrooms, that was the number of bedrooms. You wanted one for the parents and five for the kids. So everybody had their own bedroom. And that's how you knew yeah. if that family, if that house was worth a lot because the kids didn't have to share bedrooms. Well, the number of children has changed in the Utah market since you know the last 40 years. So we can't use the same adjustments that we were using 30, or 20 or even 10 years ago because the market changes. Um, and again, this is where your value as agents, you recognize things that matter right now to our clients. So 
uh, the last two years, I have been the keynote speaker at the Utah State Tax Commission. Um, the Tax Commission is all of the assessors in Utah. That's who oversees them. And they asked me exactly this. What are buyers in Utah looking for right now? I didn't just make it up. I actually did a survey of agents across the state. And this survey was very specific in what is mattering the most to your clients right now. Um, taking out specific things of, you know, different market conditions and prices. And we have always been taught in real estate that it's location, location, location. And for the past 15, 12 years that I've been doing this survey, location has always been the number one most important feature to buyers until the last two years. And two years ago, we saw a change for the first time that I've ever seen. And location became the second most important feature. The first important feature, the most important feature was the condition of the home. And if you think about what did we see happening in the market that would explain that? Well, with COVID, we started to see people working from home or remote working. So the location and proximity to the office no longer mattered quite as much as it used to. Same with school districts. 10 years ago, a school district and the boundary of the school district was a conversation that I had a lot more and more, uh, more commonly with my buyers than I do now. Why? Because now there's charter schools. And now there's boundary exceptions. People don't have to live in the school district to attend that school district. So the market has changed what some buyers are looking for. Also, when you think about condition, if you have had to remodel or repair a property over the last few years, you know, one, it's very hard to find a contractor who actually shows up and finishes the job. And two, it's expensive. Buyers are also seeing this. So buyers are like, oh, you know what? Condition is more important. I'm going to, if I have to get a house that needs a lot of repairs, I'm going to ask for a much bigger price reduction than maybe I would have a couple years ago. So that's how, you know, your knowledge, when I talk about that, agents are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So this is information that you as agents already know, but now we need to express that and give that information to appraisers. Also, economic factors will impact certain micro markets more than others. Right now, interest rates for the last year and a half, the increase in interest rates have been the conversation that, you know, most real estate transactions have revolved around. But if you're selling a home in the over 2 million market, look at Park City, right? They have had a record number of cash buyers. Interest rates aren't impacting in a negative way that market. In fact, you could say that the high interest rates have actually helped those high end markets because they're getting more cash offers than they ever have because those buyers don't want to have to pay those interest rates. So not all economic factors will impact the same market in the same way. Again, this is the information that as buyer's agents working in these markets, you already know. Now I just want you to express that and write that down for the appraisers. Okay, this is the single greatest tip that I can give you when you are worried about the specific number that you need to assign for an adjustment for something. You honestly never even have to make an adjustment to complete a CMA. There is an appraiser or an, an agent I know, she's been an agent for, you know, 15 years. She's never completed a traditional CMA, but her listings are always priced very well. And I asked her what she did at one point. And she always looks for the range of value. So a range of value is actually something that all appraisers could use. Whenever I do a listing appraisal, or I used to do listing appraisals, instead of giving them one specific number, I always gave a range of value and said, this property is worth between 400 and 450. Now, the benefit of that is a listing agent. If you look for a range of value rather than a very specific range or a very specific number, it allows you to give your sellers more input on the final list price. I always recommend to my sellers, if you're going to get good activity on a home, list it within this price range. If you list above the range of value, anticipate your home sitting on the market for longer. 
if you list it below the range of value, your house is going to sell very quickly and your seller is going to have different goals, right? So that allows your seller to be like, you know what, maybe we're going to list it somewhere right in the middle. We're looking for a quick and easy sell. We're going to list it on the lower end, that kind of thing. It also takes pressure off of you as the agent. If you give your clients a range and say your house is going to sell between 400 and 450, rather than saying your house is going to sell for 450, and then you only get offers at 435, with a range, your clients are like, oh, Ashley, you nailed it. You said it would come in within this range, and here's our offers. They came in within this range, and the appraisal came in within that range. When you give a pinpointed number and say, your house is worth X amount, if you don't if you don't get that exact amount, it can make it look like you don't know exactly what you're doing. So I never give in a listing presentation or when talking to my clients after receiving a listing, I never give a specific number. I always give a range of value. And then I put some of that discussion back on the sellers to make that decision of exactly where they list the home. Hey, Ash, I'm going to just jump in real quick. Yep. Hey, uh, we have lots of mics in our company, but there's a mic that's on the the Zoom. And I've had a couple people ask if you can mute your mic, your uh, yourself as you're doing whatever what? it is you might be doing. So uh, thanks, Ashley. Okay. Thanks, so Mike. <laughs> to, determine, to determine the range of value, uh, one of the easiest ways to determine the range of value as an agent is to actually look, you've got all of these properties, you've determined that they're comparable. What are they selling for? That's your first range of value. If you've got six comps and they're coming, they're selling between four to 450, that's the very basic first range of value that you look at. Then you're going to start to look at some other some other aspects, which we'll go over in just a minute to kind of help you narrow that down a little bit. But that's how you can start to look at a CMA without ever making an actual monetary adjustment. Okay. Okay. So what if the there's no comps at all, or you have a very unique property that the comps are a little bit harder. It's one thing to say, hey, Ashley, you know, it's a typical suburban neighborhood. I've got some comps. The adjustments, the differences aren't really that big. So to make that narrowed range of value is a lot easier. But what if you have something like a his like an old church that's been converted into a home? How do you find comps for something like that? Sometimes there are no comps or what we would see as a traditional comp, right? There's nothing that is very obvious um, or they're, they're very hard to find things with that feature. So here's a, two tips that I love to use on unique and hard to comp properties. The first one is a historical analysis. If that property has ever sold in the, palette, in the past, then you have the data that you need to show the appraiser. So here's an example. I sold a property two years ago that was a condo no a townhouse in Ogden this project had dozens of townhouses but there were only three that had main floor living all of the rest of them you had to walk up several flights of stairs to get to the living area to get to the kitchen or the bathroom or the bedroom so I had clients that he needed main floor living he was a retired injured uh, marine and that was the only thing that mattered to him was that everything that he needed be on the main floor. So he loved the neighborhood and told me if a house ever comes on the market in this project that has main floor living, you call me. One came up, I called him, we put it under contract. We got Tidewater. Now I knew that the appraiser was looking at the fact that in the past year, not one of those townhomes had sold for the purchase price that we were offering. We were significantly over what the next highest uh, sell in that neighborhood in the past year. However, our, our, pro our, our uh, property was the only one with main floor living. And there were only three in that subdivision that had that floor plan. So what I did is I went back in the past and I showed that every time my property sold, 
And every time the other floor plans that had this or the other units that had the same floor plan sold, that they sold between eight to 12% more than the homes that were the two story. So I shared that analysis with the appraiser. I did not talk about the comps that he used. That didn't matter. What I talked about in my analysis was the fact that historically, this floor plan has always sold eight to 12% more. Our purchase price was 9% more than the other units in that subdivision. Two days later, we got our appraisal back and it came back $5,000 higher than our purchase price. So we went from Tidewater to an appraisal over. And the only thing I used was a historical analysis of that difficult to comp property. So that's a great example, right? The other one is to go outside of what you think of as a typical neighborhood or that one mile rule. So if you've ever had an appraiser say, I can't use that comp because it's over a mile away. That's not necessarily true. There is not a hard rule that all comparables used in an appraisal have to come within one mile. However, if within one mile you have properties that are comparable to your property, the appraiser is not going to look over those and skip those and go further away to find one that matches the value you want. So that's something that's super important. But I know that Dan has an example, right, of this neighborhood. I do, yeah. Should I, uh, I'm going to steal the screen from you. Yep. When we're playing. Um, yeah, so I, I, I used to live in near Thanksgiving Point, and I'll show a map here to demonstrate. But in Thanksgiving Point, there, um, you know, there's a couple neighborhoods right around Thanksgiving Point. And can you guys see that okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, let me mute, get rid of some of these. So here's here's Thanksgiving Point, right? You have the, the golf course here and the gardens and everything else, right? You also have a river kind of coming here on the west side. You have the I-15 on the east side. And so you have a lot of barriers or boundaries that kind of, there's not a ton of homes. And so when you do a mile radius around my home, which was right here, you get little nips of uh, a brand new neighborhood, Holbrook Farms, and you also get a bunch of comps up here in Traverse Mountain. So this is like straight one mile radius, right? And this this neighborhood here in Traverse is a little bit older. Uh, frankly, this neighborhood above my old neighborhood, which is this little triangle piece, is also a little bit older. And so these just aren't the best comps. These are brand new, these are old. These are old. And so really, when you look at the best comps, you kind of have to go out a little bit. And you'd have to talk to the appraiser about um, this neighborhood down here. It was built at about the same time as ours was built. Um, it's ivory. Ours was MacArthur Homes. And so, you know, pretty similar or comparable builders. And it's just outside of a mile radius. And so I had won several repraisal rebuttals in my neighborhood for, for neighbors um, just by saying, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Appraiser, as you consider this river here, this should be your boundary. Salt Lake County to the north should be your, your boundary. I-15 should be your boundary. And you really ought to be using Cranberry Farms. And so I'd use a southern boundary of 2100 uh, north. Um, and so it, when you do loop in these comps here, right? You get a ton more data and the data is going to be way more relevant, right? This is going to be, these are going to be similar, much more similar to these homes than any of the other ones, especially as I did this this morning, there's no recent comparables right in this particular neighborhood. So this is a, a scenario where you can really look at like the characteristics of the neighborhood and say like, hey, these, I'd rather use these than these or these. Um, and so, you know, being the professional looking at your, the characteristics of your home and say, I, you know, that this, this would help an appraiser, you know, select the comps, even though these are outside of your one mile, um, radius. Great. Thanks for that, Dan. You're spot on. Okay. I'll, I'll seed control back to you. Perfect. Okay. If um, I can remember how. I think you did. Already. Or are you not seeing my screen? Uh, I'm not seeing your screen yet. 
Um, where's your name? Does anybody else see my screen? I see my screen. It's a mystery. <laughs> Just give me, here we go. I made you host now. Okay, should be good. Do you see it now? Don't see it. Okay, hold on. Hey, you're the host now. Oh. Still don't see it? Nope. Nope. Okay, hold on. You messed me up, Dan. I know, right? <laughs> Let's see. Let me try it again. Do you see it now? No. Okay, let me start all over again. Hold on. Sorry, guys. No, it's my fault. I'm not sure why I didn't. Well, it is. I mean, I'm just going to leave you now. <laughs> seamlessly uh, make you host and allow you to share again. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, I'm just, I had to click out of my presentation. So give me one second, guys. Okay. Sorry, guys, give me one second. Clicking through this. Okay. Okay, so um, another example I like to give when talking about this is, again, going back to the horse property, okay? So if you've got a typical buyer, we've already talked about determining who the typical buyer is. So if you have a market or a property that in your market, a certain specific typical buyer is going to look for, going back to horse property, are you going to compare a home within one mile of your property that say your property is one acre, it's zoned for two horses, and you've got a little barn and a corral. Are you going to show the same buyers a house that's three blocks away that is on a quarter of an acre, not zoned for large animals? No, it doesn't matter that it's a quarter of a mile away. It's not the same property. It doesn't have the same features. So if you're in a market like West Weber or West Davis County, where there is a lot of horse property, but maybe those properties are five miles away from each other, you're going to go five miles away and you're going to tell the appraiser, hey, the typical buyer is looking for horse property. So here's the most comparable horse properties that we could find in comparable neighborhoods and comparable markets that as a buyer's agent, my buyers would buy a home in West Haven that had horse property and they would buy a home in far west that had horse property, even though they're 10 to 15 miles away from each other, they would consider that the same market. So you just need to explain to the appraiser why you are using those comps that you are and why you are going outside of that one mile traditional radius. Okay, so this is all, everything that we've talked about is all stuff that you should be looking into and taking track of during the listing process, right? So um, you have your listing, you've done all of this analysis, and now the appraiser calls you to do the appraisal. This is the point where you should be giving the appraiser all of the information that you have. The appraiser does not need to see a traditional CMA. In fact, a lot of appraisers think traditional CMAs are kind of garbage. And the reason they do is because of the MLS having those fixed numbers for so long, appraisers learned to just discount a CMA that came from an, from an agent. What appraisers like is your knowledge on the market. So this could come in an email that explains Hold on real quick, Dan. So this could come in an email that explains, this is the number of showings that we had. This is the typical buyer. This is the feedback that we received. 90% of the people who saw my listing that had a barn wanted it or looked at it because it was horse property. 
So now I've just identified for the appraiser who that buyer is. That buyer is looking for horse property. And I've, I have proven that by saying 90% of the people who came through, that was the feature that they liked the most. Um, Dan, before I move on, what were you going to say? Uh, real quick, hey, Jenny Brady, do you mind muting your mic real quick? That'd be awesome. Then the other thing, Ashley, uh, can you start a slideshow? That'll make it easier to read what you have on the screen. Oh, and I'm sorry. Last, I thought it was on mine. Uh, I can see the tiles and stuff like that. Okay. So, sorry. So the there. other thing I would say is something early on you said is doing work early. And so the best way to combat a low appraisal is doing the work early, right? Is getting the comps and helping the appraiser understand why the comps need to be uh, what they should be, right? So why certain things, what, what makes your home better than other comps that might be low? I mean, do the work early, understand where your value is. If you know that there's going to be an appraisal issue, do the work early, right? Have comps printed out ready for the appraiser highlight why yours may be superior to those those comparables and, and direct kind of the thought process of the appraiser beforehand rather than waiting until afterwards and telling the appraiser, hey, you're not very good at your job. Here's why you suck. And here's why we're going to have to have a big, long conversation of like why you're not very good. Like it's way easier to brown those and have cookies and brownies ready for the appraisers. It works. Um, and then also have some help, like, hey, I've done some work for you. Isn't this awesome? Aren't we great? Here, I've done some work for you. You don't have to work as hard on this one. Here's the, here's the information that you, you need. Uh, you know, doing the work early is going to be the number one best way to help the appraisers not have an issue. Um, and, or at least come to a meeting of minds of where value ought to be. For sure. Okay, now let's say that you did not take our advice and you waited for the appraisal to come in low before you give this data to the appraiser. <laughs> so when you have a revision of value, the first thing I tell agents is to look at the appraisal report and write down the comps that the appraiser already used. Do not, in your revision of value, submit those same comps to the appraiser. <laughs> It's something that happens at least 50% of the time. And let me give you some insight into the appraiser mind. The appraiser does not want to do more work than they have to. They do not want a reconsideration of value and they do not want to have to go back and do a full new market analysis. So if your revision of value includes comps that the appraiser has already used, they're going to use that to quickly shoot down your reconsideration of value and they will simply say, this comp was already used, okay? They are going to assume that you didn't even look at their appraisal report because you all you just sent them a comp that they've already used. And they're going to be very dismissive of everything that comes after that. So make sure you are not sending comps that the appraiser has already used. But look at the comps. Did the appraiser bracket or give weight to the most important feature of the property? I had a property in Salt Lake that my buyers wanted a three-car garage minimum. In this area of Salt Lake, finding a one-car garage was a bonus, right? So needing a three-car garage, it took us a year and a half to find a property that had that. When we got the appraisal back, it came in low. And the appraiser had given a $6,000 adjustment for the garage. And that was all. Well, the, this garage was massive. It was the number one reason that my clients purchased the home. So when I looked at comps, I didn't look at just comps in the neighborhood. I looked for comps that had a three car or more garage. And when I found those homes, the adjustment, like the value was so much higher. And when I called all of those listing agents and said, did the garage have an impact? Every agent said it was the number one reason that the buyers purchased the home. I gave that data to the appraiser and I said, the comps are limited. I get that. There's no comps within one mile that have a three car garage, but here's some other areas in Salt Lake and here's some other listings that do. And I think the adjustment needs to be higher. And I gave the appraiser, I was the buyer's agent. So I wasn't able to give that information to the appraiser 
beforehand, right? As a listing agent should have done. The appraisal came back at our purchase price. Um, it was a $65,000 reconsideration of value. But after the appraiser saw the data that I had on garages and he realized how important that extra garage space was to buyers in the market, he agreed with my analysis and he brought the he brought the value back up. Um, so you want to definitely make sure that that important feature that buyers were looking for is highlighted in the appraisal that it's considered. Also, does the appraiser have the complete picture on the listings? Um, on your listing, as well as the comps used in the report. We've all listed a home where we know that there's a comp in the neighborhood that on the MLS looks really good, but the reality is there was a chain smoker who smoked three packs a day for 40 years that lived in that property. Well, you can't see that based off of an MLS listing, and the appraiser has likely not gone through that comp. So if you see that comp used in the appraisal report and it's bringing down the value of your subject, that's an easy information to give the appraiser. Hey, by the way, I noticed you use this comp. Did you know the following about this? Please verify this with one of the agents on that transaction, right? Then the appraiser can go back and say, oh, I had no idea. It wasn't mentioned in the MLS. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm no longer going to use that comp, or if I do, I'm not going to give it as much weight, or I'm going to make an adjustment for a negative condition, right? So there's very often times where I have worked with some of the agents in our offices about a reconsideration of value, and they have known so much about the comps in that market that are being compared to their property. And all I did is say, hey, write down everything you know about all of these comps. And at the end of that exercise, they had an entire email to send to the appraiser about why adjustments needed to be made on these comps. And that's a great way to get a reconsideration of value because you're not trying to tell the appraiser that they were wrong. You're showing them that there was information and data that they were not privy to. And now you're coming in and giving them that information that they need. Um, also, share the information you used in your full analysis, do not just give three comps to the lender and say, here you go. That doesn't help an appraiser. What helps an appraiser is the why. Why are the comps that you're providing better than the comps that the appraiser used? And be honest, don't just be like, because they support the value, right, that I want. You need to say, because they have these features or the typical buyer would look at these and these, but not the ones you used. Um, or maybe the comps that he used, the appraiser used are great, but not the adjustments, right? So share that and don't just give comps. But here's the thing, and this is an advantage that those of us at Associates have. We have great relationships with our lenders at Lifetime. If you are using Lifetime lenders for your mortgages, you have an in that most agents do not have in that we can talk to our loan officers and say, hey, don't just give three comps, send my analysis, my revision of value verbatim to the appraiser. Let them see my analysis. So going back to that garage example in Salt Lake, the buyer was using a lender from a different company, right? This was a few years ago. And I wrote a very strong, reconsideration of, val of value analysis. It was four pages long. The lender comes back to me within 24 hours and said, the appraiser said that he's not making any changes. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, he said that the comps he used are the best ones. And I said, well, I wasn't complaining about his comps. I gave some other examples of comps, but he could still use the comps that he was using. It was his analysis of those comps that I was questioning. Come to find out that the loan officer, or rather the processor, instead of giving him my multiple page analysis, just stripped out the addresses of the comps that I mentioned and sent those over to the appraiser with no analysis included. I told the loan officer, go back, try again, send my email as it was written verbatim to the appraiser. The loan officer did it, 48 hours later, it came back $65,000 higher. It wasn't the comps, it was the analysis that mattered. So make sure that when you are doing a revision of value, 
that is more than just a couple of new comps, that the appraiser is actually getting that full analysis because some processors and, and uh, loan officers will not give appraisers that full data. I know that there's some lenders in town that are big lenders, popular lenders, and they refuse to give any kind of verbiage. They will only do comps. So knowing that, I would never recommend that lender because if a reconsideration of value is needed, you're going to have a very hard time. Now, the workaround is as a listing agent, you can always give your analysis directly to the appraiser and just say, hey, I don't know if the lender has already given this to you. If not, it should be on its way. But here's my data. Hope this helps, right? And get that to the appraiser. So if your lender is one of these lenders, like Intercap, Intercap will strip out the addresses of your comps from your analysis. And you have to push back really hard with Intercap to get them to send the whole analysis for whatever their processors do not like to do that. If I know that they're using Intercap, I don't even wait for Intercap. I just, I send it to Intercap and I send it to the appraiser at the same time. And then I just back off and let them read the analysis. I love so, that. So which leads to the question. Oh, sorry. I, no, I wanted to jump in real quick here. I think one, we're, we're up against time. So I, I, I feel bad about wasting a little bit of time, but I did want to hit on something really quick with what you're going over as far as appraisers adjustments and such. I'm not sure everyone knows how to read an appraisal report and see where appraisers are making those adjustments, right? So in the appraisal report, there's going to be the UR AR form, and that's six pages. And on the second page of that report is where you're going to see the sales comparison grid. And that looks a lot very similar to our CMAs. And so you're going to see lots of adjustments. What I think too many of us miss is that further into that report, and it's in random places, is often a supplemental addendum where the appraiser is going to talk, walk through their thought process of why they made adjustments the way they made adjustments. Some things I look for is often canned languages or just like, hey, this they've just copy pasted and they don't really think through why they made specific adjustments. And so to Ashley's point, they probably didn't miss a comp. Maybe they did, but they probably didn't. What they probably missed is the analysis of making adjustments from the various comps that they do have, especially in specialized properties. So make sure you're looking through your report and it's a lot of words and there's some there's a bunch of like report legalese crap that you got to sift through. But when you can get to the uh, supplemental addendums to really start reading why the appraiser made the adjustments he made or she made, then you can start saying, OK, I understand why you thought this, but maybe you ought to think of it this way. And then to Ashley's point, itemize and write down. Here's why. I think that's what's really important about reading these reports. The other thing I would probably look at is um, the, especially in markets that are uh, in that are going up quickly. Like hopefully we'll get to eventually someday, like a market conditions form, and making sure that the appraiser is using the data that they have provided in their report. I've seen lots of appraisals, especially when the market was going up, where if you go to the market conditions form. They say the properties are increasing and they're going crazy and here's the percentages, but then they did made no adjustments for that to the comparables that they were using that are four, six, eight, 12 months old. And so those are, you know, one, I would actually read the report. And then two is in the report, does he have data that doesn't make sense or is he not using the data that he himself provided? Perfect. So going on, can you talk to an appraiser? Um, Dan and I have both reiterated multiple times how it's so important to get this information to the appraiser before the appraisal. One of the reasons is that once an appraiser has a, uh, an assignment result, meaning they've already determined the value or the, the price of the adjustments, they can no longer talk to you about those items. So if you can get to the appraiser before they have completed their report, you can say, hey, I think this adjustment, this adjustment, this adjustment, this value based off of my analysis is what you should look at. But once they turn in the results, once they turn in their appraisal report, they can no longer talk to you about value. They can only talk to the client and the client is not the borrower. The client is the lender who orders the appraisal. 
So if you are having an appraisal done for mortgage purposes, your client, regardless of whether the fact they paid for the appraisal is not the client for the appraiser, the lender is. So once the appraiser has determined appraisal resorts, which are adjustments, the final value, condition or quality, they can't talk to you about those items anymore. Appraisers can talk to you about physical characteristics. So if you think the appraiser messed up on the square footage or they missed a room count or the materials that were used in the home, they didn't talk about it, they can talk to you about that, but they can't talk about the final value or why they made the adjustments that they did. So know that that's another reason for getting to them early is beneficial to you. To you. Um, just real quick, there are five components of market value that the buyer and seller are typically motivated, that both parties are well-informed, well-advised, and acting in their own interests, that a reasonable time has been allowed for exposure in the open market, payment is made in terms of U.S. currency, and the price represents the normal consideration of the property sold, unaffected by special or creative financing or sales concessions. So the reason I bring this up is that these five components of market value are included in every mortgage appraisal. And the appraiser is actually certifying when they sign the appraisal report that their estimated market value meets the five components of market value. So going back to something that we talked about earlier, which is the range of value. There is a range of value in every appraisal report. Some appraisal reports will actually show the range of value or they'll state the range of value and say, hey, the range of value, especially on FHA appraisals, it's supposed to be a requirement that the FHA appraiser states the range of value is between 400 and 450. If you've got a contract at 450, the appraiser has stated that the range of value is between 400 and 450. And your contract meets these five components of market value, that should be, in theory, enough to get a reconsideration of value because the contract price is within the range of value and it meets those five components of market value. So anytime I do a reconsideration of value, I always include that component. I say, hey, this contract meets the five components of market value. It falls within the range of value. And I've given you the above data to show you why this is justified. And that's where I end it. So I know that this was an hour. It was super quick. I tried to go through it as, as quickly as I can, but hopefully this gives you an idea of the kinds of analysis um, that we should be looking at when we list properties. And then obviously a lot of this would also apply to buyer's agents when trying to determine a good price that that home is actually worth. Um, does anybody have any real quick questions? Dan, was there anything in the chat that I missed? Nope, nothing in the chat. Okay, Are well, you going to share this slide deck? Sorry, what? Could you share this slide deck with us? Yeah, I sent it to Dan. Dan, do you want to send it out to anybody who wants it? Yep, I'll uh, I'll I'll uh, make sure it gets sent out to the to everyone. Okay, perfect. Awesome. And then if you guys have questions, you can always reach out to me or Dan, and we're always going to be happy to help you with these questions. But again, if you guys can start doing these kinds of analysis before the appraisal, you're going to find um, that you have a much higher success rate. Awesome. Lady. Thank you so much, Ashley. This is super good. We actually had a bunch of people online. There was almost 50 of us here. Okay. So that's, uh, that's really great. Um, okay, everyone. Well, uh, yeah, hit us up if you ever have questions and thanks for joining us today. Sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, bye-bye.